Let me turn off the interrogation lights. There we go. All right. Um, as you know, and humor me if you don't know this, <laughs> but as you know, your project design is due next week. Oh yeah, remember that. <laughs> Um, and, and for the rest of the semester, completing a project is really uh, a high priority um, item. Um, and therefore, uh, please bring to class any questions that you have concerning your project. And, and bring it to lab as well. Sometimes you might have questions that are, that are very specific to your uh, project, in which case uh, it might be more appropriate to discuss them in lab. You can also email me stuff if, you, if you're taking a class online and I can take a look at it that way. But by all means, I encourage you to ask questions if you have questions. Um, one thing I try to do in this class is be approachable and, and try to offer a lot of different ways that you can contact me and, if you have questions. There's always lab, but you can also email me. We can arrange to, to speak on Skype. Um, a lot of, lot of options. Um, there's my office hours, there's other labs. There, there's, there's a way for you to contact me, um, I believe, if, if, if you put forth the effort. Does anyone have any questions about the project? I'm going to spend a minute reviewing what I expect to get next week. All right? Just so that you're completely sure. All right? I'm expecting this. I'm expecting a design document. What is a design document? Think of it as being like an outline for your project. And it consists of five parts. All right, and the parts are described more detail um, in Canvas. But I'll take a minute to describe each of the parts. First part is the strategy section. That's where you give an overview of the project. You talk about the goals that the organization or the creators of the site have for the project. And the goals of the users of the site. Again, if you're talking about a band making a website, the creators of the site would be the band that's making the site. If we're talking about a website uh, about um, a fan site about a movie that you you like you know if you're a Star Wars fan or a video game fan and, and you're talking about um, World of RuneScape or something like that uh, you, you know you, you you have some goals in making the site you know maybe you want to um, you know um, get more people interested in the game or be a source of information or, or whatever. So you define your goals and you define the goals of the users. And again, these aren't simply a restatement of web design principles. It should deal with the content. For example, you shouldn't say a goal of your site is to have easy navigation. Of course you, you want to have easy navigation. But that's not why you're making the site. You're not making the site to show off, look how clear I can make my navigation. So people will visit it and click on your links and say, wow, this is the clearest navigation I've ever seen in my life. That's not your goal. You want that to happen, but that's not why you're making the site. You're making the site to promote your band. You're making the site to be uh, an informational for uh, a site for the people that play a particular video game or like a particular movie or whatever. All right. You're making an instructional site about um, how to bake cakes, for example. Your goal is to teach people how to bake cakes or something like that. That's why you're making the site. All right. Good web design principles are a way that you're going to achieve that goal. They're not the goal itself. The other thing that you define is you define what are called personas. And personas are where you make fictional bi biographies of typical people that are visiting your site and you do this so that you can keep those people in mind as you're developing the site. 
So let me Google real quick. I bet I can find an example of a of a persona for web design. Okay, here's an example. This is, the, the example that they're talking about is, um, an online shoe store called Monroe. I don't know if this is a real shoe store or fictional, but they have, whoa, jeez. <laughs> Does anyone know first aid in this class? Good, good. Um, this is an example of a, of a persona. They've actually made a person, Brandy Tyler, and they give a little picture of her, all right? And they've given a profile, and what is distinct about her? She has a special need as far as shoes go. She has narrow feet, all right? And they make up a little story. She gets very emotional about shopping for shoes because she can rarely find a pair that fits her narrow feet. All right. Recently, she's turned to online shopping to avoid that hassle. She found Monroe after Googling narrow winch, winch shoes and reading other reviews online about the company. All right. So they made up a little story about a type of person that might be visiting their site. Now, does that mean that you make up a story about everyone that could be visiting your site? No, because then you'd have seven billion stories, right? You'd have one for every person on earth, because every person on earth has their own distinct needs and wants and so on, and characteristics. But it's better to pick a few, a handful of what you consider to be characteristic people, all right, for your site, so that when you design your site, you can look back and say, does my site handle the needs of someone who has a special need for shoes? So it's, it's not just that, gee, this website's going to uh, cater to you know, people with narrow feet. This person is represent representative for anyone that has special needs for shoes that they would have a hard time getting in a regular shoe store. So that's what she represents in this example. They're using the example of narrow shoes, but it could be someone with gigantic feet. All right? Could be someone with really wide feet. It could be someone that needs a specialty shoe for their job or whatever. All right? Although that actually might be its own persona, someone that needs safety shoes, for example, for, for some factory work they're doing or whatever. But the idea is, is that you create these. So how many do I want you to do? I want you to make three of them. Three personas. And for any topic that you think of, there's three different groups of people that might, would want to visit it. You might not think so, but use your imagination and you can come up with this. That's the first section. So it should contain a paragraph, two lists, and three paragraphs about people and make the people as real as possible. Give them names, give them pictures. That's the strategy section. The scope section is going to be a list of requirements. Remember, the goals are what you want to achieve. The requirements are how you're going to achieve it. And again, it's not simply going to be restating web design principles. You're not going to say, it's a requirement that the site has easy to follow navigation. Of course you want, we know that, all right? You don't have to restate that, all right? But what you do have to say, for example, is if you're doing a website for a band and maybe one of your goals is to um, gain new fans, well, how are you going to gain new fans? Well, maybe you're going to gain new fans by having um, a page where you have uh, video clips from some of your band shows. Or maybe you have a, uh, a schedule of your performances. Or maybe you have 
one song that they can download if they want to, and then a link to purchase your recording if, you, if, if they want, or something like that. There's all kinds of ways that you could achieve the goal of gaining new fans. All right? You have to decide what mix and what things are going to work for your particular audience. How do you know who your particular audience is? It's the audience that you defined in the personas. So this is simply a list of things. Your list should cover all of your goals. All right? So if one of your goals for your band's website is that it should inform people where you're going to be playing, and you don't have anything on your site that informs people where you're going to be playing, then you need to go back to the drawing board, right? Because one of your most important goals, you're not addressing at all. So that needs to be in the requirement. There needs to be coverage. Everything that you put in the requirement section should correspond to at least one of the goals, and every goal should have at least one requirement associated with it. The next thing is a structure chart. And a structure chart shows how your page is going to be organized. Maybe you're going to have a home page with four pages off of it. Or maybe you're going to have a home page with two pages off of it. And each of those pages have two pages off of it. You take a look at all your requirements and you figure out how to break it down into pages. So this is simply a list of maybe 15, 20 pieces of content that you're going to have on your page. Well, you're not going to put all 20 items on one page. And you're not going to have one page for each item. You're going to group things together in a way that makes sense. So that's what you do in the structure section. You decide how you're going to group the stuff together and you decide how it's going to be organized and how the navigation is going to work. Um, you should explain why you picked that choice. And you should explain some alternatives that you considered. So for example, the shoe company, we could break things down by um, the, 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 shoe, the online shoe store that we looked at here for this poor woman that has narrow feet. All right. We could say that we're going to break it down by brand. I don't know any brands of shoes other than athletic shoes, so you'll have to forgive me. You could have a section for Adidas, a section for Nike, a section for Converse. That's one way you could break it down. Or you could, have, you could break it down by athletic shoes, um, dress shoes, um, work shoes, and so on. You could break it down by men's shoes versus women's shoes versus children's shoes. There's a lot of ways that you can organize the pages on a shoe store site. What you have to do is decide what's going to work best for your audience. That is, your personas. The next step is what's called the skeleton and that's where you sketch out the basic layout of your pages and you say this is going to be my header section this is going to be my navigation this is going to be the content this is going to be the footer these are called wireframes They're called wireframes because they're, well, I'm not sure exactly why they're called wireframes, all right? But they're frames. They, uh, they, yeah, the frame part I get. The wire part I don't really get because there's no wire involved here. You know, don't turn in a spool of wire and say, here's my wireframes or something like that, right? They're frames. In other words, you say what's going to be in each section. You don't necessarily describe the details of each section, but you define what sections you're going to have on your site. Now, for a small site, Hint, hint, most of your wireframes are going to look very similar to this because most of your pages are going to be organized where you have a header that explains like what your site's about. You have navigation, which are your links to your different pages. You're probably going to have a footer and then you're going to have a content area. 
So you can rearrange that a little bit, but for the kind of, for the size of site that you're making, that's probably going to be what you're going to come up with, or very close to it. If you'd prefer, maybe the navigation will be horizontal instead of vertical. All right. Now, you don't necessarily have one wireframe for your whole, whole site, but you probably don't need one wireframe for every individual page. In other words, one of your goals as a designer is to have consistency. All right? So you don't want every page to look different, at least at this level. All right? You want the navigation to be in the same place on most of your pages. Now, maybe the home page of navigation is organized a little different because it's the home page. You, you're, you know, that's the front page that people, most people are going to enter your site via. All right? So you might have a couple wireframes for the size of site that you're doing. But you're probably not going to have like three or four or five wireframes. You're probably going to have one or two. All right? And they're probably going to look a lot like that. Now, if you have a page that's different for one reason or other, like a gallery page, maybe you have a different layout for that. All right? The last portion of your design document. So far, everything that I've talked about is going to be like in a Word document or a text document, a PDF. All right? We haven't written any HTML code yet for this. You know, this is sort of the blueprint for what you're going to do. The last step is a prototype. And what's a prototype? Another word for prototype is a model. Another thing that you can think of is a rough draft. For the prototype section, you will develop three pages, three of your pages, and they don't have to be 100% complete. But they should be complete enough that a person viewing your site could look at it and make comments about it and tell you, no, I, 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 I want a darker color blue. The color blue that you chose for the background is too light. I want a darker color blue. Or, gee, I would, ra I would rather rearrange it and put the navigation on the left instead of on the right, or something like that. Um, the one thing that's true about people is that reading the design document, although it contains valuable information, um, a lot of times people have a hard time really imagining what a site's going to look like until they actually get it in front of them. And then they start looking and saying, oh, okay, this is what I want to do. And in a way, you have to have a little bit of a thick skin because sometimes people will look at your prototype and tear it apart and say, no, I don't like that. Well, that's okay because you present the prototype to get that sort of feedback. All right? And then once you get the feedback, then you know what the customer wants. And you can go ahead and create that. All right? So what you will turn in will be a Word document containing the first four sections and then um, rough drafts of three of the web pages and the CSS associated with them. Again, the CSS, you'll probably only have one CSS file. All right? You probably don't need multiple CSS files because you want your, your pages to look consistent. You should be able to do everything in one CSS file. Any questions about this? Anyone stuck on an, an, an idea for a project? Anyone have an idea of a project that they want to share or that they have questions about? Yes. When you say, when you go back on what you've written... On the website, like um, the information on my website, do you want me to reiterate that into the document? Because I know that it's important to have the scope part. Actually, it should go the other way around, right? You create this document first, and then you create the website. Right. Okay. So in other words, in your scope section, you list all the things that you're going to put in the site, and that will be the stuff that you'll put on the web page. Right. So what, what is the topic of your site? Cake decorating. So for example, maybe one of your 
maybe one of your requirements would be to say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to share uh, um, two icing recipes. All right? So, you know, you'd say you have a recipe for this kind of icing, a recipe for that kind of icing. That would be in your scope section. I'm going to have this as a recipe, that as a recipe, and then that would be the stuff that would actually be on the pages. No, you don't. You don't need to. You, you you just you just describe the content. You don't need to go, go in detail. Like so, it would be sufficient to say, "I'm going to have a recipe for buttercream icing." Okay. You don't have to actually put the recipe there. The the actual recipe would appear on the page itself. Okay. Right. Again, it's it's think of it as like a sketch. It's a design. You're you're planning on what you're going to do. Later on, you actually finish out all the details and, and all that. But this is your plan of what you're going to do. You know, th think of it almost like a to-do list of to-do, this is what I'm going to put on the site. So on your to-do list for your personal life, you might say bake a cake. You wouldn't need to include the recipe as part of your to-do list. You, you would need to have the recipe later on when you actually did it. So, other questions? All right, the next thing we're going to talk about the next topic that we're going to talk about, and I talk about it because it's a topic that I don't think gets sufficient attention, and that is website accessibility. And when we talk about website accessibility, we're talking about making websites that work well for people with special needs, all right? People with a variety of disabilities. And I'll say there's even experience, it's been my experience, that there's even people that have done web development for a while that aren't really familiar with accessibility or maybe they understand a part of it but they don't understand another part of it. Um, a lot of times people think when you hear accessibility you th they think um, instantly of like well this is what we're going to do for people that are blind. All right, Because blind is the obvious disability that affects the way a person accesses the web. Right? Blind people can't see the screen. And the web is such a visual media, how do you accommodate people that can't see the screen? Well, you accommodate people that can't see the screen as well as accommodate people with other disabilities through two mechanisms. One is called assistive technology. And the other is what's called universal design. Assistive technology is any sort of technology, it could be hardware or software, that helps people with special needs navigate through the web. All right. Universal design is what we can do. That's sort of our responsibility by creating our page in a certain way, we allow people to use their assistive technology to access our page. Let me give you an example not dealing with the web, but dealing with um, a real life situation. Um, assistive technology would be like a wheelchair, right? A wheelchair helps someone that, that can't use their legs move around. That's, that's a piece of technology that, that was created to do that. Where does universal design come into play? Well, universal design comes into play by doing things like making sure your doorways are wide enough to accommodate someone that's in a wheelchair. All right. What are some other pieces of universal design that you could see that would help someone in a wheelchair get around campus? An elevator, right? Um, you can't get a wheelchair up the steps, at least not easily. There's one other thing. If you walk on the bridge between the business building and the college center, sometimes you see it. The button to open the door. All right. So those are all examples of universal design. And the phrase universal design is used as opposed to special needs design or disabled design or something like that 
Because these little design things can help not just people with disabilities, but other people as well. For example, when would an elevator, are, are, are people in wheelchairs the only people that would ever use an elevator? No. Why would someone else use an elevator if they're not in a wheelchair? Yeah, they could be temporarily injured, so they might not be disabled. But um, I hurt my hip two years ago, and going up steps still can be a problem for me. So there's some days if I'm, if I'm feeling a little tired or, or if I'm feeling a little sore, I'll take the elevator just to make it easy for me. I wouldn't consider myself disabled, but it's nice, to, it's nice to have that option. Let's put it that way. What about someone that is taking a cart, like um, a cart that contains like a projector or, or uh, something that they're going to use in a class to demonstrate? That would be an example. What about someone carrying a bunch of stuff that doesn't want to carry a bunch of stuff up a flight of steps? All right, They might use an elevator. So that's the idea of universal design. And that's what we're going to keep coming back to, is that these things that we think about that we're going to put into our website that help people with disabilities also are going to help people that don't have disabilities, at least under certain circumstances. So we may do something because, you know, you know, we do that because it's going to benefit someone with certain disabilities. But it's also going to benefit people who don't have those disabilities or who have a mild form of those disabilities. All right? At the very least, there may be some assistive technology that we use that will never help someone that doesn't have that disability. But, at the very least, it won't get in their way. For example, let me, let me check this to make sure before I say. All right, outside is the room number, 105. You ever notice what's directly underneath the room number? Braille, all right? Now, How many of you have ever used Braille to find a room here? Probably not. All right. How many of you, however, the fact that there was Braille there made it more difficult to find a room? I didn't. You just ignored it. All right. It didn't really get in your way. So that's a characteristic of universal, tech, uh, universal design. All right. Sometimes it helps people even people that don't have the particular disability for which the universal design was created for. And other times, it might not help them, but it doesn't really get in the way. All right? So we're going to translate that sort of thinking into web design. And we're going to create things that are going to help people with disabilities, but either they'll help other people sometimes, or at the very least, they won't get in the other people's way. So that's our goal with universal design. Now, before we, um, before we consider some of the techniques for universal design, let's make sure we understand the different disabilities that can affect people who are accessing the web. All right? What are some of the disabilities that can affect people in accessing the web? Well, I'll give you the first one, the one we already mentioned. People that are blind. All right? It might be surprising to you that people that are blind can even access the web to begin with, right? Because the web is such a visual media. You know, how do people, quote, view a website if they can't see it all? How do they access a website if they can't see it at all? Any ideas? Yes? They use a screen. They use a screen reader. And what is a screen reader? A screen reader is a piece of assistive technology that reads the screen. 
Now there's, there's a, a low end one that's built in the windows and you can also purchase higher quality ones that do a better job. Um, let me tell you a, a quick story. Um, several summers back, um, I had a summer fellowship at, at NASA, where NASA Glenn Research Center, where I went in and did some, some work for them. And I shared an office with a high school girl that was blind. You know, she was like a high school sophomore, junior, you know, 15, 16, something like that, and she was blind. And she accessed a computer and she did pretty much everything on a computer that you would expect a kid her age to be able to do. You know, make a Word document, make a PowerPoint presentation, surf the web, um, chat with her friends via instant messenger when she should have been working, the whole thing. You know, anything that you would expect a teenage kid to do, she was able to do. Send emails and so on. And she did it via screen reader. And it was really odd because if it isn't clear to you yet, I'm not a morning person, all right? So I would come in later than she would. You know, she would be there, I don't know, 8, 8.30, and I'd stroll in 9, 9.30, yeah, you know how that goes, something like that. And I would come into our office, and the office would be dark, right? Because she would need to turn the lights on because she can't see, you know? And her screen would be dark. She wouldn't even turn the monitor on. And she'd be there typing away at the computer, doing whatever it is she was doing. And how was she doing that? Well, she had her headphones plugged in and the screen was being narrated her, to her and telling her what to do. Now, occasionally she'd run into uh, a situation where the screen reader didn't do an adequate job and she'd call me over and say, you know, What's, where's my cursor at? What's going on on my screen? And I'd take a look at the screen and I'd tell her what she needed to do or help her out or whatever. But for the most part, she was very self-sufficient with that. And it was really amazing to see that. And it was amazing even, not just working on the computer, but just finding her, her finding her way around <laughs> NASA Glenn Research Center. I mean, that's a big place. I had a hard time finding my way around it. And imagining someone that can't see, it was amazing. But you never know what you can do until you have to adapt to the circumstances. So with that assistive technology, she was able to, again, overcome the disability that she had and be able to do what pretty much anyone else could do. Let's see if we have a, a narrator in this screen, uh, on this computer. I will promise to you this will be annoying. All right, because I'm going to bring them, I'm going to start up the narrator, and we're going to listen to it for a while, and I promise to you it will be annoying. However, if this is the only way that you could navigate and use a computer, you'd figure out a way to make it work for you. So let's go in, and let me pull up a website. Here's a website about design called A List Apart. Oh, and look, they even have personas listed here. Huh. Imagine that. I swear I didn't realize that that would be the case. So in Windows, underneath Accessibility Options, Ease of Access Center. Always in this section. All right, let me try turning up the volume. Let me start the narrator. Start. Initialize Microsoft Narrator window. Focus on quick help button. Location bar. Desktop backslash all control panel items backslash start on screen keyboard button. Set up high contrast button. Is reading the contents of that window. Let's go to this page. Control panel, home, tool tip, location bar, desktop, backslash, all control panel items, backslash, start on screen, keyboard button. Stop loading this page, tool tip, set up high contrast button, 
Start magnifier button. Okay, it's still reading the screen to us. Start narrator button. Tap. Tap. Start on screen keyboard button. Home. Tool tip. Home. Tool tip. Set up high contrast button. Okay, it, it's Microsoft not going... Window. Focus on quick help button. I told you it would drive you crazy at a certain point. Um, again, it kept reading this screen to us. It, wouldn't, it wasn't shifting over. Now, there might be a command to get it to shift over to that uh, and read the web page to us, but I'm not familiar enough with it to do that. Um, but the idea is, is it, was a, it was reading the screen to me and it was telling me what to do. You can use your keyboard then to navigate through a page by pressing the tab and the arrows and so on and get to it. Remember, if you, um, if you can't see, you can't use a mouse, right? Because you can't point to something on the screen if you can't see. So screen readers and assistive technologies are one way that uh, is one piece of assistive technology that can help people um, access it. There also are Braille displays that will take the text and convert it to Braille that you can actually tactily touch and read that way for people that are doing that. So blind is a very extreme case and it's a very obvious case. But there are other sort of milder versions of blind, if you will, less severe disabilities that relate to your vision. What would some of those be? Colorblind. Now, do colorblind people see in black and white? No. Is anyone in here colorblind? Does anyone know anyone that's colorblind? Okay. How do they, how do they see? Have they ever explained to you how Right, greens and reds. There's several different kinds of color blindness. There's not one thing that is color blind. All right, it depends on you have rods and cones in your eyes, and that's as much as I know about what's in your eye. <laughs> All right, but depending on how those are set up, and if there's a defect in one of them, you're not able to, to distinguish between different color blindness. There's actually some good tools out there that we can look at to get a sense of how people that are colorblind see. There's actually a colorblind filter. And what you can do is you can upload an image and it will show you how someone that's colorblind will see the image. And again, Notice that there is more than one options here. So for example, if you have, and again, I wish you could make the screen wider to read the whole thing, but if you have this kind of color blindness, that's how you would see this image. If you have this kind of color blindness, that's how you'd see it. and so on. There also is something that allows you to pick a web page and so like if you created a web page and put it up on the web you could go and then test how the page would look for people that have different color blindness. So here's Google which should be a quick page to load and I'm going to pick what is called protonopia, which is red-green color blindness. That's the one that you described. That's one of the more common ones. And so it will show no green cones. So it will show what Google would look like if you had this color blindness. Let's pull up Google. Oh, I'm typing in Google, and there it is. All right. That's what Google would look like 
if you didn't have color blindness. Let's go and view it. might take a little while. Hmm. Didn't seem to work. Let's try another one. Okay, this one's looking better. Here's eBay, and here's what eBay would look like if you had red, green color blindness. And you can sort of see the logo here, you can see it peeking out, doesn't match. In other words, what's green, the E is green, oh, I'm sorry, the E is red and the Y is green. Use that, using that filter, both of those sort of turn into sort of like a mushy, brownish, olivish color. And again, 73% off a of list price. It's interesting, it's displaying slightly different. Oh, it is the same. There's, yeah, it's, it's green. So here, again, it's that sort of olive-ish color. And on the regular eBay page without the colorblind filter. And then again, you can change it to say, well, what if you have this form of colorblindness? How it will look? And so on. So, my point here is that we can talk about the disability of blindness, but there are, more, there are, there are variations of that disability that also come into play. All right? What are other related uh, problems with vision that you might have that would affect your ability to access the web? Pardon me? Glaucoma? Glaucoma? Sure. I'm not specifically... I don't know specifically what happens when you have glaucoma, what happens to your vision. Uh, it's, it's almost... You, you build up in pressure in your eyes. Uh -huh. Okay. 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 Um, a good explanation. I said it, 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 you have pressure build up in your eye, it gets fuzzy, then it gets darker. Um, other conditions. Well, just plain old bad eyesight. Right? It's people that can't see very well. I have really powerful glasses and I don't see particularly well. All right, so playing poor vision. And eyesight along with, yeah, go ahead. It just went sideways. It just went sideways, yeah. I do that every two or three weeks, I think. Let's see. Now, is it upside down? Yeah. Okay, sideways the other way and back to normal. All right. There's a number of these things that when you lump them together, um, they describe them as age-related conditions. So in other words, when you get older, you don't necessarily go blind, but for most people, your vision gets poor when you get older. All right. Um, hearing is the next thing that we're going to consider. There are people that are completely deaf. Now, when you get older, not everyone goes completely deaf. However, most people exhibit some loss of hearing. So, sort of a catch-all for sort of mild versions of all of these, mild to severe, depending on the person, are age-related conditions. What I want to do now today is come up 
and, and complete a list of some of the other things that would affect someone accessing the web. And then next time, on Tuesday, we'll look at what accommodations you can make for people with these disabilities. All right? What are some other conditions not vision related? I think we have a good list when it comes to vision. What about other things? Yeah. And motor control. Now, that can range, again, from very severe cases. Someone that has ALS, like Stephen Hawking, right? He can't use a mouse to control a computer, right? Um, people that are paralyzed, people that are paraplegics or quadriplegics, they can't use a mouse, they can't control that. So there, again, there's those extreme cases. Then there are less severe cases. What would be a less severe case of someone that has difficulty, ability, using their hands? Besides someone that's paralyzed or totally has a, a loss of limb or the loss of usage of their limbs? Parkinson's, right? With Parkinson's degree, uh, disease, your hands shake. So that would be a, an example, a neurological example. What would be another example? Well, arthritis, again, another one that gets sort of lumped into the age-related conditions. Um, repetitive, um, what do they call Repetitive motion injury, all right? In other words, someone that spends a lot of time on the computer sometimes, just like anyone that does the same sort of motions with their hands over and over and over, can develop uh, injuries like that, and it can be quite painful. Uh, I've, I've had students that, that, because of their job or whatever, they, they have uh, issues with that. Um, so, and again, it's not just computer stuff, but, but like people that play the violin, for example. Their hands in a certain position all the time, they can get that kind of injury, and it makes it difficult to move around and all that. So, any of these motion control issues would be a problem. Other sorts of things that could be a problem. Yes? Would being a left-handed count, that's an interesting one. Um, I would hesitate to call that a disability, but um, that could pose some problems. That really could. Um, now, I know, for example, that most mice you can configure to work left-handed or right-handed, and you can switch the buttons around. Because again, typically the, the, the button that you click most often, you want to have underneath your index finger, and then the button that you click less often is underneath your, your middle finger. Well, I'm pretty, sh I'm pretty sure most operating systems allow you to configure uh, a mouse so that you can use, um, so it's oriented the other way. Um, so, that would be an example of something. And again, the assistive technology there would be be able to configure the mouse to, to do that. Other examples? Well, hearing. All right. That affects the ability to access audio account. Uh, or, or audio content, rather. All right. And of course, there's a mild form of these disabilities, right? In other words, you're not deaf, but again, guess what? As you get older, <laughs> you know, all these things come down to when you get older, right? Um, you know, you're, you're, you, you don't have as good a hearing as, as when you're younger. You know, I mean, how many times a day I'm like, what? What? You know? Um, and again, even younger people can, can have problems where they're not necessarily deaf, but they're hard of hearing. Now here's a case too where circumstances could make it difficult to hear. So you may have perfect hearing, but if you're in a busy lab, for example, with people walking around talking and so on, maybe for example, you're in our lab upstairs where we don't even have speakers for the computers. All right? 
So temporarily, you're not able to act, if you didn't bring headphones, you're not able to access any audio content. All right, that could be a problem. Last but not least, there are a whole range of cognitive issues. Including things like uh, cognitive and neurological issues. Things like epilepsy can affect your ability to access the web because certain animations can trigger seizures. Um, people that are dyslexic have a hard time reading because uh, of, of some of, you know, because they have issues distinguishing between certain letters. All right? Um, people that have uh, a, a attention uh, deficit disorder are, are more apt to be distracted by things and might have a difficult time. That may, uh, that may have an impact on their ability to access the web. So all these things are considerations that we need to take when we, design, when we develop our web page. All right? And we want to make our site in such a way that we accommodate people with these disabilities and we provide either benefit or at the very least don't affect people that don't have these disabilities. So we'll talk about that next time. How we can, what we can do on the site to accommodate people that have these disabilities and either help out people that don't have these disabilities under certain circumstances or at the very least be like the braille outside the door and not get in their way. So that will be what we will talk about next time. Any questions? All right, we'll see you up in lab.